Good morning and welcome to Morning Worship on this Friday the 27th of August and we're from St Peter's Church in Ipsy. My name's Linda Nicholas and I'm part of the ministry team there and it's really good to catch up with you today and share worship. O oh Lord, open our lips and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. May Christ the day star dawn in our hearts and triumph over the shades of night. O oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us heartily rejoice in the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving and be glad in him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. Come. Let us worship and bow down and kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God. We are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and shall be forever. Amen. May Christ the day star dawn in our hearts and triumph over the shades of night. Blessed are you, creator of all. To you be praise and glory forever. As your dawn renews the face of the earth, bringing light and life to all creation, may we rejoice in this day you have made as we wake refreshed from the depths of sleep. Open our eyes to behold your presence and strengthen our hands to do your will, that the world may rejoice and give you praise. Blessed be God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God forever. In the church calendar today, we remember Monica. Now, Monica was the mother of Augustine of Hippo, who was a major Christian writer, theologian, theologian and philosopher. Monica was born in North Africa in 331 of Christian parents and was a Christian throughout her life. As a girl, she was fond of wine, but on one occasion was taunted by a slave girl for drunkenness and resolved not to drink thereafter. She was married to a pagan husband, Patricius, a man of hot temper who was often unfaithful to her, but never insulted or struck her. And it was her great happiness to see both him and his mother ultimately receive the gospel. Monica soon recognized that her son, was a man of extraordinary intellectual gifts, a brilliant thinker and a natural leader of men. And the story goes that as a, as a youngster, he was head of a local gang of ju juvenile delinquents. Monica had strong ambitions for her son and high hopes for his success in a secular career. Monica, however, grew in spiritual maturity throughout a life of prayer and her ambitions for Augustine's worldly success were transformed into a desire for his conversion. He, as a youth, rejected her religion with scorn and looked to various pagan philosophies for clues to the meaning of life. He undertook a career as an orator and teacher of rhetoric and moved from Africa to Rome and hence to Milan, as that was the seat of government in Italy at the time. His mother followed him and there was a few years later in Milan, Augustine met the Bishop Ambrose and from whom he learnt that Christianity could be intellectually respectable. 
and under whose preaching he was eventually converted and baptised on Easter Eve in 387 to the great joy of his mother, Monica. After his baptism, Augustine and a younger brother and Monica planned to return to Africa together. But in Ostia, the port city of Rome, Monica felt ill and fell very ill and said, you will bury your mother here. That is all I ask. Wherever you may be, you should remember me at the altar of the Lord. Do not fret because I am buried far from home in Africa. Nothing is far from God. And I have no fear that he will not know where to find me when he comes to raise me to life at the end of the world. And we will read the collect for today, a collect remembering Monica. Faithful God, who strengthened Monica, the mother of Augustine, with wisdom and through her patient endurance, encouraged him to seek after you. Give us the will to persist in prayer that those who stray from you may be brought to faith in your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading this morning is Psalm 120. Psalm 120. I call on the Lord in my distress and he answers me. Save me, Lord, from lying lips and from deceitful tongues. What will he do to you and what more besides you deceitful tongue? He will punish you with a warrior's sharp arrows, with burning coals of the broom brush. Woe to me that I dwell in Meshech and that live among the tents of Kedar. Too long have I lived among those who hate peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, it appears that the topic in this 120th Psalm is slander. The psalmist was under attack by a slanderer and sought the Lord's help. He was apparently greatly distressed by these attacks, as any of us who has ever been attacked by slander could understand. Save the Lord from Save me, Lord, from lying lips. He first asks the Lord to deliver him and then suggests that the Lord might strike the attacker with sharp arrows and burning coals. In the concluding verses, the psalmist bemoans that he has stayed so long among the tribes of Meshech and Kedar, who were known as an uncivilized and cruel people. Whilst he sought peace, they hated it, wanting war instead. It may have been due to this difference that these people fought him with slander. Slander is a particularly malicious practice which has potential to destroy a person's reputation, even causing them to lose their livelihood. Yet there is often little defense against it regardless of the source or the accusation. No matter what evidence is pre presented against slander, public opinion often retains doubt about the person. Once the seed of slander is planted, its roots are difficult to eradicate. Not only is slander malicious because of the damage it can do, and because there is little defense against it, it is malicious because the victim is always innocent. By definition, that is the nature of slander. It is words 
falsely spoken that damaged the reputation of another. The sin of slander is strongly spoken against in the New Testament. Christians are not to be guilty of this sin. We might unthinkingly slip into gossip, for instance, but cannot unthinkingly slip into slander. It involves forethought and intent. It requires planning to determine the accusation and give a modicum of truth to the charge. Reputation is the target of slander making, those of good reputation most susceptible to attack. This is a malicious practice. It is a sin that should not cross the mind of Christian to be used against another. And if we should find ourselves a victim of attack, the primary resort, the first thing that we should do is to do as the psalmist did and return to the Lord for help, just ask him for his help, cry out to him for his help. He can do better than anything else that we could attempt to find anywhere else to help us. Just ask the Lord. We come to our second Bible reading, which is Zechariah 6, verses 9 to 15, a crown for Joshua. The word of the Lord came to me. Take silver and gold from the exiles, Heldiah, Je Tobijah and Jedidiah, who had arrived from Babylon. Go the same day to the house of Josiah, son of Zephaniah. Take the silver and gold and make a crown and set it on the head of the high priest, Joshua, son of Josedek. Tell him, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Here is the man whose name is the branch, and he will branch out from his place and build the temple of the Lord. It is he who will build the temple of the Lord, and he will be clothed with majesty and will sit and rule on his throne. And he will be a priest on his throne, and there will be harmony between the two. The crown will be given to Heldiah, Tobijah, Jediah, and Hen, son of Zephaniah, as a memorial in the temple of the Lord. Those who are far away will come and help to build the temple of the Lord, and you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. This will happen if you diligently obey the Lord your God. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, Zechariah has seen eight visions and the visions portrayed a God who is sovereign over the nations, a God who punishes the evil of the nations and removes it from Judah. A God who re-establishes the temple and covenants with his people. And a God who restores the priestly and royal functions to Judah. Zechariah 6, 9-15 stands as a prophetic comment on the visions. The meaning of the visions is embedded in the word of the Lord. The fundamental meaning of the visions is that the temple will be rebuilt. As Israel returns to God, so God returns to Israel, which is the basic message of Zechariah that we read earlier in the week in Zechariah 1. The temple will be built and God will come to dwell among his people. The memorial crown is Judah's assurance that God will accomplish his promise. God will return to his people, just as assuredly they have returned to the land of their forefathers. 
This word encompasses more than the rebuilding of the temple, but taken with all the visions, it points to another who will unite the priestly and royal offices of a new temple of God. It points to a time when the nations themselves will become part of the people of God. The crowning of Joshua is real but symbolic and functions as divine representatives in Judah, but they point beyond themselves to a messianic figure. There is a temple to be built by those who are far off, which probably refers not only to the Jewish scattering, but also the inclusion of the nations. The temple of Joshua is not the final temple, the final dwelling place of God. Rather, the Messiah will build a new temple and the reign of God will fill the earth. And ultimately, that reigning Messiah will bring a new Jerusalem to the new heavens and new earth, where there will be no need for a temple because God and the Lamb will dwell there. We come to a time of prayer. Today, we are asked to pray for the cathedral staff, for Val Floy, Chief, Chief Operating Officer, for office staff, burgers, musicians, librarian and archivist, archaeologist, surveyor and architect, education team, stonemasons and service team, for the friends of the cathedral, for all who serve as volunteers and all members of the cathedral's regular congregations. Let us pray for the progress of Christ's mission in the church during difficult times. Especially we pray that here at St Peter's, you may offer your guidance and your help to show us the way forward. We pray for Reverend Garth, the church officers and members of the church council in their responsibility as leaders in making known the gospel of Christ in our neighbourhood. Help us to grow as kingdom people, as and when the new deanery plans come into effect, we pray for all those who struggle with change and we pray that any new structures might be affected, that it may offer more flexibility, that it may deploy ministry to better meet pastoral and missional needs. God of all hopefulness, we bring our prayers to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We think now of those in most need in our own communities, the elderly, the housebound, those in care homes, hospitals and hospice, and those undergoing treatment, those recovering from treatment. We thank you for all the work of the NHS, caring agencies, and all the work with hard work and dedication to look after patients and others who they care for. We thank you for their skill and compassion. And we uphold to you hospital chaplains, and we especially pray for David Ryan, the chaplain at the Alexandra Hospital here in Redditch. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we continue to pray for those for whom we pray. We pray for all those who require medical help at this time, particularly those with pre-existing or chronic conditions. We ask that they might be given healing help in this very uncertain time. We pray for all those suffering from depression or anxiety. We ask that they may know your soothing presence. We pray for all those people named on the couch. We share a moment of silence together as we bring before you 
those known only to ourselves and to you, Lord, who are in need at this time. May they feel your presence in their lives as we have named them in our hearts and commit them to your loving care. At every moment of life, you are present in sickness and in health, in sorrow and in joy, in tragedy and celebration. Yet at no single moment are you more needed than now in this pain and suffering. May your holy presence be felt today to those who are ill. May they know your love, your comfort and your peace. God of all hopefulness, we bring our prayers to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who feel the pain of grief at the loss of a loved one, where recent or as each anniversary passes. So we pray with confidence that Jesus Christ is the light of the world, a light which no darkness can quench. And today we remember all those we have known and loved, but see no more. For you turn our darkness into light, and in your light shall we see light. God of all hopefulness, we bring our prayers to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And a final prayer for ourselves. Your hope arises with each dawn, pushing back the rubble of our lives. Each new day reminds us of your grace. You paint hope across our skies. Into the deafening cry of hopelessness, you whisper love. Love that catches us, holds us. There is no end, just new beginnings. No finish, just new starts. Into your resurrection, we follow you to bathe in hope. You are alive, not only in the world, but in us. So that we carry your hope within our souls. Help us to lift our eyes and feel resurrection hope arise in our lives. Amen. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And we say together the prayer that Jesus himself taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Amen. May the Lord show us mercy. May the Lord grant us peace. May the Lord bring us joy. And the blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us always. Amen. Let us go in the light and peace of Christ. Thanks be to God. Well, thank you for joining me this week and I hope you all have a lovely weekend. Sunday service is online and in person in church at 10.30 and morning prayer continues every weekday next week at 10 o'clock on the usual YouTube channel. Bye for now.